que ela espera, que ela espera. Exio timi senad elfi tu iporgiud que ton eforion. Epitropi tis americani quis scolis, que tis genediu bibliothicis. Mele tis didicusas epitropis tis americani quis scolis. Senad elfi ton panepistemion que xenon scolon, fitites que fili. Me megali mu haras as calles oriso edo apopse, stin etisia senandesi tis americani quis scolis classicon spudon stin athena. Herome puvlepo tosus pulus edo apopse. Episis, calisorizo osus, mas paracoluthon dia victia ca. Ime ibon oescot, dia thintria tis americani quis scolis. Ime timimu apopse, pu mirazome mazisas to ergo tis americani quis scolis, ton telef teo crono. Meta tim parousiasimu, i Sharon Stalker ke o Jack Davis, tu penepistemiu, tu Cincinnati, tha parousiasun, tis neis sinari pastikes anacalipsis tus, pu rignon fos stus princepes tis pilu, tin epohi tu calcu. Sto iporgio a politismu ke atletismu, tha ithla na efkarastiso therma, tin iporgo lina mendoni, to ieneko grammatea iorgio didascalu, tin ieneki the eftintria archeotiton polixeni adam veleni, ke oles tis the eftintis pu iposterizun to ergomas. Sa afto to simio, tha ithala na sas parasiazo, to ergo ke tin apostoli tis americani kis skolis sta anglica. Esteem colleagues of the ministry, the ephorias, our trustees and overseers, and the members of the managing committee of the American school, colleagues of universities and foreign schools, students and friends, it is a great pleasure to welcome you this evening to the open meeting of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. I am Bonna Westcote, director of the ASCSA. It is my honor tonight to share with you the work of the American School of Classical Studies over the last year, after which there will be a presentation by Sharon Stalker and Jack Davis on their new discoveries that shed light on the Princess of Pylos in the Bronze Age. The American School is a unique organization. We are not state-sponsored, although we enjoy a close relationship with the U.S. Embassy in Athens. Rather, we are a consortium of 190 universities, colleges, and museums in North America, which are committed to the study of Greece from prehistory to the present. We are governed by a managing committee drawn from those institutions and guided by a deeply committed board of trustees, as well as overseers for the Gennadius Library. We have an office in the United States, and our main campus is here in Kolonaki. But our scholars and students take us across the breadth of Greece, ancient to modern, literary to scientific. It is their achievements that I present this evening. We are most essentially a community. And as we are joined by new members, so we mourn the loss of those who are no longer with us. Pam Be Pamela Bembo, regular member. William M. Calder, managing committee member. George Huxley, director of the Gennadius Library. Barbara Johnson, summer session and agro research fellow. Charles Kahn, visiting professor, managing committee member. George Kennedy, managing committee member. Marion Holland McAllister, Editor of Publications. Nasus Mikas, Gennadius Board of Overseers and School Board of Trustees. Oscar White Mozzarella, Fulbright Fellow. T. Leslie Shear, Regular Member, Director of Agora Excavations and Managing Committee Member. And Andy Stewart, who never held an official position and yet in so many ways that was the heart and soul of the place. We will miss them all. 2022 
brought the retirement of two icons of the school, Jennifer Niles, who served both as chairman of the managing committee and director of the school, and John Camp, director of excavations in the Athenian Agora, whose career there spanned some 57 years. Sylvie Dumont retired after many years of service in the Agora. The new arrivals to fill their outsized shoes include me as director of the school and John Papadopoulos as director of Agora Excavations. We in turn are pleased to welcome Katie Garcia Fine as assistant director of, at the school and Irini Dimitriadu as assistant to the director of the Agora. Each year, the Alumni Association awards the Aristaya Award to an alumnus, alumna or alumnus who has provided exceptional service and contributed in an extraordinary rare way to the school's mission. I am very pleased to announce that in 2022, they chose Margaret Miles, who served as Mellon professor for six years, as well as member of the managing committee. And the winner in 2023 award is Craig Mosey, who has worked in the Athenian Agora, currently as deputy director, for some 40 years. Although we announced the renovation of Loring Hall Residential Center at last year's meeting, the official opening took place in the summer of 2022. I take, uh, did I say that right? I guess it, yes, 2022. I, I take this opportunity to thank everyone who supported the project as students and scholars have found it a remarkably comfortable and congenial place to live and work. The academic program is central to the mission of the school. It's part of our name. Though uh, through summer and year long programs, we aim to reach students across a wide range of disciplines, interests and experiences. In the summer of 22, we are back on the road with Matthew Harrington leading the summer session across Greece. And Daniel Levine led a summer session addressing Thanatopsis, Greek funerary customs through the ages. Amalia Avramidou and Denise Dimitru took their students north, program north to focus on Macedon and Thrace. And the Wiener Lab conducted three summer sessions. Takis Karkanis and Paul Goldberg ran both the course on archaeological sediment micromorphology at the Wiener Lab and the field school on site formation, stratigraphy, and geoarchaeology in the Athenian Agora. In addition, a new course was offered on bioarchaeology, organized by Ioana uh, Mutafi and assisted by Dimitris Michalidis. Our academic regular member program is unique among the foreign schools in committing an entire year to intensive field trips across Greece, academic seminars, and excavation training. The faculty this year was led, uh, the program this year was led by Brendan Burke as Mellon professor, with Catherine Kiesling and Sanjay Thakur serving as Whitehead distinguished scholars, each offering seminars in their areas of expertise. 11 regular members uh, from eight different universities in the United States attended the regular program this year, accompanied by a large number of associate members uh, and fe uh, uh, who fellows from a full range of universities in North America and Europe. And there they are. <laughs> in the fall, the regular members are often on the road uh, uh, and uh, they go far and wide as these maps made by our Mellon professor attest. Now the director gets to lead one trip and I think you know which one I chose and where we started. Uh, Samothrace. Uh, it is, after all, a very good place uh, to uh, learn about the inextricable connections between architecture, cult, and landscape in ancient Greece. While our students in the regular program are mainly prehistorians and classicists, they are deeply interested in late antique, post-antique, and Byzantine history and material culture. They also understand the critical role landscape, environment, and natural resources play in understanding the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, they took their next trip uh, uh, to Western Greece, led by Andrew W. Mellon Professor Brendan Burke, 
where they visited sites as far north as Yonina and then down to the western coast, including Nicopolis, Patras, Olympia, Pylos, up then to you know, Kalamata, Sparta, and up into Arcadia. The third trip uh, visited the island of Crete and was led by Tom Brogan from the INSTAP Study Center and Natalia, uh, Natalia Wojgekov Brogan, director of archives of the school. Brendan returned to take the, lead the fourth trip again through central Greece, including Phocis and Boeotia, where you see the students at the site of Elion, where he is the co-director of excavations. Professor Chris Pfaff, director of excavations at Corinth, led the trip to the Argolid and the Corinthia, and here you see them at the Basilica of Leonides at Lechio. I joined them for a very cold but beautiful day at Phleas, Idonia, and Stymphalos. In the winter, we focus on Athens and Attica, as well as the islands of Salamis, uh, Evia, and Aegina. Now, the success of our academic program really relies on the support of the Ephores across Greece. And therefore, on behalf of all of our students, I want to express our deep appreciation and thanks to the Ephores who generously gave their time and attention to ensure that our students had the best possible opportunities to learn about Greek history and material culture. So thank you uh, from the bottom of our hearts. Now, while the regular members were on the road, uh, the advanced fellows were pursuing their own research agendas. The classical program had some 12 pre- and postdoctoral fellows working on everything from weaving to worked animal objects, mathematics, architecture and time, fantastic narratives, and cult song. The Gennadius has sponsored seven fellows who work on a range of topics from Syriac Christianity, Byzantine chivalry, Ottoman military strategies, to music, carnival, and Attica's architectural landscape. And here you see them in action during their work in progress seminars at the Zombana, in the Zombanakis seminar room. We have uh, yet more uh, postdoctoral fellows from uh, the school here you see in action. And then also the Wiener Lab fellows. The uh, Wiener Lab hosted seven fellows who had an extraordinary range of research projects across material, periods, and scientific approaches. Now, all departments are engaged in sharing ideas with larger audiences through exhibitions, symposia, lectures, and concerts. Exhibitions in the newly opened Macriani's wing offer especially good opportunities to connect past and present, as well as break boundaries between uh, text and image. Over the summer, director of the Gennadius Library, Maria Yorgopoulou, curated the exhibition Epistrophe, or Comeback, which featured the paintings of contemporary artist Andreas Georgiadis that were inspired by the poetry of C.P. Cavafe, whose early editions from the Gennadius were also on view. And here you see Andreas actually discussing his work with viewers. To mark the 100th anniversary of the Asia Minor catastrophe, the archives organized an exhibition devoted to the literature of the interwar period. The Epic of Anatolia in the Greek imagination drew on rare archival material from the personal papers of seminal Greek writers, including novelists Stratis Meravilis, Elias, Elias Venezes, George Theotokos, and poet George Seferis. A final section of the exhibition explored the contemporary Turkish experience through the works of Turkish writers of the same period. And here you see the two curators, Natalia Wojgekov Brogan, director of archives, and Natasha Limos, overseer, with Christina Angelopoulou, the granddaughter of Miravilis. To accompany the exhibition, we had the premiere of Tospiti Metis Rodies, a documentary about the novelist Stratis Miravilis, explored from a more personal perspective. And in the Gennadius main, uh, Library main reading room and online, Irini Solomonidi, our head, uh, a senior librarian, curated the exhibition Books of Asia Minor, which highlighted Greek book production in Asia Minor from 1821 to 1922. The current exhibition, uh, and I encourage all to go see it, uh, Dionysia Solomos, Two Flames, Manolis Horos, 
puts in dialogue the art of Manolis Haros, Haros and the early poetry of the Greek national poet during the Age of Revolutions. The exhibition is curated by Maria Yorgopoulou and Dr. Simos Zenios of UCLA. Again, it was very special to have the artist on hand to discuss his work. You know, for those of us in antiquity, this is really an unimagined luxury. <laughs> now we have equally exciting exhibitions planned for coming years, including one highlighting American humanitarian relief aid, 1918 to 1929, scheduled to open in October, and another on Vrzaki, the lost neighborhood of the Athenian Agora in the spring of 2024. Concerts of classical music brought to Kotzen Hall, the young musicians of the Curtis Institute of Music, thanks to the support of the Schwartz Foundation. While the music of Northern Epirus and Pontus filled the space with lively sounds of traditional folk music, thanks to the efforts of musicologist Christopher King. During the academic year, we held three symposia, marking the 100th anniversary of the Lausanne Peace Treaty, the school's archives and the Hellenic Parliament Foundation co-organized a colloquium about the international uh, humanitarian response to Greece in 1918 in the wake of World War I, and again after the Asia Minor disaster in 1922. John Papadopoulos and Sylvia Fashard organized a symposium on Athens and Attica in the early Iron Age, a sequel to the Bronze Age Conference held in 2015 and I convened our Getty Connecting Our Histories program for a conference on architectural interaction beyond the Northern Aegean in the Hellenistic and Roman periods. For a conference at the French School dedicated to unsung pioneering women in Greek archeology, span members and staff spoke about Leslie Walker Cosmopolis, Hazel Hansen, Lucy Talcott, and Marie Farnsworth all of whom played vital roles at the American school in its early years. Our program of individual lectures also seeks to share knowledge widely. This year for the Gennadius, three lectures on memory, life of refugees in Athens, and nostalgia in literature and music commemorated the 1922 centenary. The archi annual archives lecture explored Americans excavating in Anatolia before 1922 and a musical celebration of the International Day of Poetry with the poet Tidius uh, Patricios attracted a very wide audience. The classical lectures mainly featured the work of our very fine members. And the Fitch Wiener Lab Seminar Series, after a break of almost two years, was restarted uh, in collaboration with Dr. Vangelio Criazzi, director of the Fitch Lab. Five seminars have drawn the archaeological audiences here in Athens. The Friends of the Gennadius Library have continued to be very active and creative under the wise leadership of Catherine Bura. Fabulous trips to the Vatican and Lebanon brought new friends closer to the library, whereas various presentations here in Kotzen Hall, including a discussion of the actress Mimi Denizis about her film, Smyrna, My Beloved, and a lively uh, lecture uh, by historian Victoria Solomonidi on the brother of Ioannis Gennadius, who died in London at a very young age, stimulated the interest of all. Now, our departments have even more to report, and I would like to share with you the acquisitions from the Gennadius Library, uh, it, which continues to enrich its collections. Thanks to the generosity of the Gennadius overseers, the library acquired several remarkable works, either at auction or through donation. Here we share three of them. A wonderful hand-drawn plan of Candia, Heraklion, besieged by the Ottomans in 1669. A 19th century notebook of a teacher with algebra problems. Now, do take a look at that. It's a, quite a, an extraordinary display that's almost a little frightening. Oh. 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 But, uh, but it's just algebra. Oh. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, and then also several really exquisite specimens of 18th century books uh, that add, uh, include like the valuable edition of the Antiquities of Athens by Stuart and Rivette from the library of the late Nikos Bakopoulos. And we're very grateful to his widow, Calypso Guthi, for this precious gift. 
Among the highlights in this year's acquisitions in the archives were more scrapbooks of Francis Henry Bacon, architect of the Assos excavations in 1881, of large, I mean, we should really say a very large rug that uh, once belonged to the Schliemann family, and about 400 letters sent to Carol Matouche by the late George Huxley, who donated his vast archive to the American School in 2008. For the Bligan Library, Marie, uh, Maria Tornal reports that the collection has grown to over 120,000 books and periodicals, with a continued emphasis on print format. The new webpage, Research at the Blagan Tips, includes all the available tools for patrons' research. And we have a new seminar room. For the Wiener Laboratory, Takis Karkanis reports another year of intensive research with some 30 researchers conducting studies in more than 20 archaeological sites spanning all cultural periods from the Lower Paleolithic to the Byzantine and in almost all fields of the archaeological sciences. The lab also continues to be an important hub for training students in the archaeological sciences with more than 20 volunteers and two interns. The flagship Phaleron bioarchaeological project has made considerable progress having almost completed the conservation of 1,200 burials. Professor Jane Bykstra and her team have ex uh, accelerated their studies with important results to be announced soon. Takis Karkanis, director of the lab, is participating in the scientific advisory board of the Max Planck and Harvard Research Center for Archaeoscience of the Ancient Mediterranean, a scheme with very important and ambitious research projects related to the analysis of, analysis of ADNA in Greece. This collaboration has resulted in several fascinating studies that shed light, new light on the origin of Indo-European language and Mycenaean ancestry and produced new demographic data on the population mixtures and intermarriage practices between biological relatives during the Bronze Age in Greece. Our Princeton-based publication office continues to produce important publications related to the mission of the school. Two new volumes in the Corinth series are the first results to be published about their respective areas at the site. Anastasios Antonaris presents the glass remains found east of the theater, and Mary Sturgeon presents the marble sculpture found in the gymnasium area. Also published is another volume in the Isthmia series by John Hayes and Kathleen Slane on late classical through Hellenistic pottery. In our Hesperia supplement series, on the edge of a Roman port, edited by Elena Korka and Joseph Reif, presents the final results of the Greek-American excavations on the Kutzengila Ridge at Cancriai, the east port of Corinth. Volume 91 of Hesperia contains a typically broad range of articles. And from here in Athens are catalogs, the catalog of Ep the Epos exhibition, edited by Nat uh, Natalia wojcikov brogan and Natasha Limos, and also the catalog for Hippos, edited by Jennifer Niles, which came out this summer and includes articles by many of our student members. We congratulate all of our authors. In closing this section of uh, my presentation, I would like to say how much the success of the school depends on all of the staff who work with extraordinary dedication. They are amazing, and I thank them all. <laughs> So we, we now turn to fieldwork and our excavations. We're delighted to report that in 2022, all of our field projects safely returned to the field. In celebration, I would like to share with you briefly a word from each project. And I also, again, want to thank from the bottom of our hearts all of the Ephoreas who, with whom we have worked, uh, who have been extraordinarily kind, generous, and uh, um, and uh, deeply valued colleagues. In his final season at the Agora, John Camp reports that excavations were carried out uh, in the area south and north of the Stoa Poikile and within the western third of the building. Several rooms south of the Poikile Stoa were exposed, 
including one with well-preserved pithoi used for storage, their mouths giving a clear sense of the floor levels in use at the time. More of the lowest step of the facade of the Stoa Poikile was revealed for the first time near its western end. As uh, elsewhere, the well-cut hard limestone step blocks are joined by substantial double T clamps with the blocks of much softer limestone used as backers. In collaboration with the Eforia and our colleagues uh, Maria Liaska and Cleo Tsonga, the, uh, uh, that we mounted on the upper floor of the Stoa, an exhibition from the Packard Humanities Institute collection of Dodwell and Pomardi views of Athens, which were done in 1805. They have been very popular, as have Craig Mousey's reconstructions of several camera obscuras of the sort used to create the original drawings. And here you see one of them here. At Corinth, Christopher Pfaff reports that excavations resumed in the field northeast of the th ancient theater, revealing additional portions of the Middle Byzantine Road, below which a deep robbing trench extended down into it the um, early, early Roman vaulted drain and ran along the axis of the Roman cardo that preceded the Byzantine Road. To the east of this drain, a, a fill of stones and transport amphoras, including at least two Spanish types of the first century AD that you see here, covered part of, the, of a smaller secondary drain. To the west of the Cardo, excavation uncovered more of the late Roman marble room, perhaps the apoditarium of, of a large bath complex. Its bench-lined east wall was exposed and additional portions of its original opus sectile pavement were, un, uh, were uncovered. Deep fill deposited in the late 6th or 7th century over the original floor of the marble room produced large quantities of vines, including the head of a full-size copy of the Castle Apollo type. Throughout 2022, the work of conserving and restoring the wall paintings excavated in the 1980s in the area east of theater continued to be carried out by a team of conservators from the Centro di Conservazione Archeologica Roma. And I think you heard them speak at last year's open meeting. The year, uh, uh, this year, special attention was given to conserving a wall decorated with garlands and musical instruments above yellow panels, a niche-like wall shrine decorated with red flowers, and a long wall with multiple yellow panels ornamented with birds. The American School continues at Corinth to provide both on-site and remote educational programming throughout the year to groups of all ages at Corinth, thanks to our Steinmetz Fellowship. At Ismia, Elizabeth Gephardt, director of the University of Chicago Excavations, reports that Alessandro Piriatini examined the construction history of the archaic temple, and Esan Babahani Nia demonstrated that there was no Roman latrine in the sacred glen as Bernier had previously reported. John Frey, leading the MSU excavations at Ismia, focused on assessing the, and improving access to the artifacts and storage, which involved structural improvements to the storage facilities, a shelf audit, and a campaign to create a digital photographic record of all cataloged artifacts. Also, thanks to the support of Yota Kasimi, the F4, uh, Socrates uh, Lambropoulos, and Jean Paris, they were able to hold an exhibition of contemporary photography at the Ismia Museum, and they look forward to similar collaborations in the future. At the Lechian Harbor and Settlement Land Project, a synergasia with the effort of the Corinthia, Paul Scotton reports that the study season focused on the analysis of the glass shell and ceramic materials. The glass, which ranged in date from Hellenistic through Roman periods, is the first certain material from the Hellenistic period and now fills the lacuna between the late classical and the early Roman periods. Kim Shelton reports that activities in the sanctuary of Zeus at Nemea centered on site maintenance, research, and the cleaning and conservation of the early Christian basilica. The conservation project aimed to conserve the lower walls of the basilica in order to abate the collapse of the upper walls that were made out of large ashlar blocks from the Temple of Zeus. 
The west end of the 5th century CE building was cleared, cleaned, including the narthex and also the west facade. Clearing areas uh, that had been excavated in the 1920s, 1960s, and 1980 revealed the building's foundations, walls, floor surfaces, and other architectural features, including previously unrecorded interior walls of the 4th century BCE uh, Zenon building. The Megalopolis Paleoenvironmental Project, a collaboration of the school and the Ephoria of Paleoanthropology Speleology, conducted its last field, camp field campaign in the Megalopolis Basin. Takis Karkanis reports that the project's main objective was to survey exposed section profiles throughout the Megalopolis lignite mines to locate archaeological evidence of early human presence in Greece. The surface survey focused on revisiting the sites identified in previous years in order to collect the cultural and faunal remains that are being exposed on the sections of the mines. At the Marathusa II site, a lithic artifact was discovered this year in the same layer as the hippopotamus bones with cut marks that were found in a previous campaign, thereby indicating the presence of human activities in the east part of the Marathusa mine. The re-examination of well-known paleontological Kiparissa III site resulted in the identification of cultural remains. It is now considered an archaeological site. The faunal assemblage consisted mainly of bones of extinct elephant, deer, and pig, but there were also bones of smaller animals, such as turtles and birds. The lithic artifacts consisted of flakes, flake fragments, and debris, as well as a few possible tools with evidence of retouching all made of radiolarite, radiolarite chert. In sum, the program resulted in the identification of five new and important Paleolithic sites in the Megalopolis Basin, all dating to the Middle Pleistocene. The sites preserve cultural and faunal remains in stratigraphic contexts and offer a unique opportunity to investigate human behavior over time for an important period in the history of human evolution and in an area that has been thus far little investigated. The new sites confirm the presence of humans during all glacial cycles of the Pleistocene from around 250,000 to, to about 750,000 years. Megalopolis appears to be the southernmost European refuge of early human populations during these glacial times. The, the project also revealed a rich record of paleo-environmental proxies that will provide the paleo-ecological framework for understanding human presence. The Mount Lycaon Excavation and Survey Project, a synergasia with the Ephoria of Arcadia, conducted the last, uh, last of its five-year permit seasons with Dr. Anna, Anna Karapaniotu, Director of the Archaeological National Museum of Athens, and David Romano and Mary Voyatsis of the University of Arizona. They report that work continued on the southern peak of the mountain uh, uh, excavating aspects of the ash altar of Zeus. Pockets of early Helladic pottery were discovered in the area immediately to the south of heavy concentration that was excavated in 2019. Two deposits of late Helladic uh, um, uh, and early Iron Age fineware were also found. An impressive and nearly complete open mouth jar was uncovered in the dump to the east of the architectural platform, confirming the, the continuous nature of activity at the site between the middle and late Helladic that likely involved cooking on the mountaintop. In the lower sanctuary, excavation continued in the Ionic building, the administrative building, the corridor, the dromos, and the newly discovered sanctuary of Pan. Most of the Ionic building has been cleared, revealing its curved interior back wall. In the area of the Sanctuary of Pan, evidence from deep levels has revealed pottery from around 500 BCE. The 12th Annual Parasian Heritage Park Field School also took place, supported by the Parasian Heritage Foundation and its collaboration with the University of Arizona, the National Technical University of Athens, and the University of Patras. The field school is devoted to the creation of Greece's first large-scale national heritage park, 
an area of some 670 square kilometers, including parts of Arcadia, Messinia, and Ellis. Turning to Crete, Jeffrey Souls and Krisa Sofianou, co-directors of the Greek American excavations at Maklos, report that they celebrated 50 years of Greek American collaboration at Maklos last summer, and they received a silver plaque from the mayor of the Satia, of Satia thanking the project for filling the Satia Museum with Maklos finds. <laughs> they completed the second and final year of their current excavation permit, excavating in two major areas of the island of Maklos. In the area of the Minoan town, they discovered one of the largest purple dye manufacturing workshops in Minoan Crete. The workshop, which provided drinking water to the Minoan town, was established at the beginning of the proto-palatial period, around 1900 BCE, and it remained in use for 500 years until the destruction of the neo-palatial town around 1430 BCE. It was provided uh, with an administrative building, two aqueducts, a reservoir, and an area to process large amounts of murex shells. On the summit of the island, above the Minoan town, the school's own Natalia Vojgekov Brogan excavated beneath a Byzantine tower and uncovered remains of an earlier tower of the second and first centuries BCE with its rooms still intact. Donald Haggis and Margaret Mook report that the Azoria project continued study and conservation at the archaic site with a focus on the archaic monu uh, monumental civic building and the Hellenistic towers at, on the peak. Research, research also centered on the architecture and stratigraphy of the proto-archaic building, evidently a complex of rooms used for feasting and sacrifice in the 8th and 7th centuries BCE, before the foundation of the archaic city. The project completed an analysis of phasing, including the process of the building's abandonment in the late 7th century BCE. An interesting discovery is a structured deposit consisting of a crater, drinking vessels, and a cooking pot, established during the abandonment and filling of the structure during the renovation of the South Acropolis to accommodate civic buildings. Moving northward, Aletis van der Mortel reports that the Mitru team continued in their 13th study season to work on the site's stratigraphy and finds. Georg Nightingale studied the corpus of 200 beads, including the fragmentary Mycenaean rosette glass relief bead you see here. Graduate student Caitlin McKenna of the University of Texas at San Marcos studied skeletal remains of 53 Middle Hellatic to Early Iron Age children and adolescents, finding much evidence for physiological stress. For the Sinner Garcia with the Rothopi Ephorate of Antiquities, Molly Votif Thrace Archaeological Project, Nathan Arrington notes that the site is often identified as ancient Strymi. The project has now fully revealed two fourth century BCE houses, the House of the Herms and the House of the Gorgon with evidence for daily life as well as economic activity. <laughs> Test trenches about five kilometers away investigated the location of possible late Hellenistic farmstead and a fourth century BCE extramural temple. Well, and lastly, of course, Ephistrephome uh, so um, smitimas. We return to Samothrace. And last summer, uh, the American excavation Samothrace continued to work in the, uh, uh, in the heart of the sanctuary, uh, aiming to identify the original channel of the watercourse that really runs right through the heart of the sanctuary. And it was, in fact, uh, uh, discovered some three meters to the west of the current channel. Through survey, we also explored the land between the sanctuary and the ancient city, which today looks quite desolate but in antiquity was actually a densely occupied area, as this uh, tile heat map indicates. In understanding the relationship of the ancient city to the sanctuary, and in attempting to determine the route by which prospective initiates came to the sanctuary, we investigated a hitherto undocumented gate, which we called the West Gate. The structure is remarkable in many ways, but perhaps most striking are the several dozen steely cuttings that wrap around its walls on two tiers. 
They indicate this gate was a prime place of display, perhaps for initiate lists, which were particular to the cult. And as the visitor left this gate and turned towards the sanctuary, they would look at, uh, they had a striking vantage across the ravine to the theatrical circle with its banks of bronze statues awaiting their arrival. Now, we had two projects that did not return to the field, but focused on publications. From Frank the Cave, the uh, publication of Ornaments and Ambiguous Finds, and from Methony, a impressive two-volume set on the results of their excavations between 20, um, uh, 23, 20, 20, 2003 and 2013. Now thus far, I have said nothing about Pelos, one of our most important sites, but that's because there are others who can say so much more and so much better than I, uh, and it's to them that we now turn. The special lecture this evening by Sharon Socker and Jack Davis, uh, uh, will, uh, they will get that, I'm Sharon Stocker, uh, is a senior research associate at the University of Cincinnati and is co-director of the current University of Cincinnati excavations at the Palace of Nestor. Stalker has also directed excavation projects uh, in surveys uh, and other archaeological projects in Albania in the territories of ancient Greek colonies of Apollonia and Dirachium. Jack Davis is the Carl W. Blagan Professor of Greek Archaeology at University of Cincinnati and co-director of the current excavations at the Palace of Nestor. He has directed archaeological projects on the island of Kea at Nemea and in Albania. Stalker and Davis have published four reports on their excavations on the Griffin, a Grave of the Griffin Warrior in the journal Hesperia, their most recent being the Grave of the Griffin Warrior at Pylos, Construction, Burial, and Aftermath, which is in the current year's Hesperia. Davis and Stalker have also pu recently published two books, A Sanctuary in the Cora of Illyrian Apollonia, Excavations in the Bone Jacquet Site, 2004-2006, and a Greek state in formation, the origins of civilization in Mycenae and Pylos. The latter will be published in Greek translation this spring by Crete University Press. Now they are invaluable members of the American school in so many ways, but their recognition also goes well beyond the us. Stocker and Davis were both honored by the president of Greece as commanders of the Order of the Phoenix. This evening, they share with us their work uh, on the Princes of Pylos, a Mycenaean mortuary landscape. I welcome Jack and Sherry. Thank you, Bana, for that generous introduction. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends. It's an honor to be here and to present the, works of, uh, the results of our work at the annual open meeting of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. Because of its complexity, it takes many, many people to make an archeological excavation successful. We are grateful to the numerous students, scholars, and visitors who have contributed to our project over many years. Before I discuss the mortuary landscape around the site of ancient Pylos, which is of course located in modern Hora, um, I want to begin with a bit of background about the Palace of Nestor itself, which is where new excavations by the University of Cincinnati began in 2015. The site is located near the coast in southwestern Greece. The palace was discovered in 1939 by Carl Blagan from the University of Cincinnati and his colleague Konstantinos Koreniotis from the Greek Archaeological Service. On their first day of excavation in a long trench that ran across the Acropolis, they uncovered part of the archives room and the throne room of a late Bronze Age Mycenaean palace. Blagan's team returned after the war in 1952, and during subsequent campaigns over the next 15 years, Blagan and his assistant Marion Rawson unearthed what is the most well-preserved Mycenaean palace known today. It had an elaborate throne room with colorful wall paintings, a highly decorated floor, 
and a large central hearth, as well as the largest archive of linear beak uh, tablets on the Greek mainland. The palace complex visible today, now protected by a brilliant new shelter completed in 2016, dates to the final phase of its existence, roughly 1300 to 1200 BC. Much was already known about the Pelian funerary landscape before we renewed our excavations in the area. As a component of Blagan's campaigns, Lord William Taylor and others had explored several nearby late Bronze Age Tholos tombs and chamber tombs. The most impressive of these is the large beehive tomb known as Tholos IV, which had a partially intact blocking wall when it was found. Constructed around 1650 BC, this Tholos is one of the earliest of its kinds in Greece. The Tholos was unearthed 100 meters northeast of the palace, and its dromos was aligned with an early Mycenaean gateway on the Acropolis. One issue that had long troubled researchers was why there was only one monumental Tholos tomb immediately adjacent to the seat of Pelian power. Our excavations have now provided an answer to that question. During our first campaign in 2015, we put a small test unit over several stones that were visible on the surface of the earth near the present day parking lot. These turned out to belong to a corner of an unlooted early Mycenaean stone built tomb that we call the grave of the Griffin warrior. The grave dates roughly to the mid 15th century BC or in technical terms, the late Hellatic 2A period. Pseudomorphs of wooden planks, a large bronze basin and a spouted bowl were the first things that appeared once the level of the grave goods was reached. The basin itself, which rested over the central portion of the skeleton, was filled with boar's tusks, ivory combs, and a bronze double axe. The boar's tusks belonged to a typical Mycenaean helmet, and many of the ubiquitous bronze fragments in the grave are part of a suit of armor. The helmet and arbor probably resemble those from a chamber tomb at Dendra near Mycenae. We now understand that the basin rested on a layer of wood, almost certainly on top of the coffin itself. A lower level of grave goods beneath the basin consisted of gold and silver vessels, gold rings, over 50 seal stones, and at least a thousand beads in agate, amber, amethyst, carnelian, gold, and glass. Two gold cups, one of which is shown here with pseudomorphs of textiles on the rim, had been placed around the pelvic region. A type C1 sword with a gold hilt rested beside the chest of the warrior. The sword in the grave is the same type as that depicted on the exquisite Pelos combat agate, one of the finest examples of late Bronze Age craftsmanship. The drawing and close-up photograph capture the details of the sword type. The Griffin warrior himself was a relatively young man, about 30 to 35 years old when he died. He was approximately a meter 70 in height, or five foot six, and of robust build. The position of the burial goods within the grave reflects a conscious plan of deposition. Bronze vessels and body armor comprised the highest layer of grave goods and were placed on and around the coffin. All the, all the weapons were placed on the Griffin warrior's left side, and the most valuable ones were found in the lowest level. On the other hand, many of the seal stones, gold rings, a necklace, most of the beads, and an exquisite circular gold box were placed inside the coffin and were on his right side. The grave of the Griffin Warrior is only one of the new elements in the Pelian funerary landscape that has been revealed by our excavations. In 2016 and 2017, we worked in an area near the southwestern end of the Dromos to Tholos IV. 
Here we uncovered part of a ritual complex that dates to the late Hellatic 3A2 early period, or the mid 14th century BC. All the walls here seem to be of that date. Beneath the walls and above the bedrock was a substantial deposit of pottery and bone, much of it in a pit. The character of the finds suggests that the deposit represents the remains of a ritual feast, also of the mid 14th century, that was used to level the ground prior to the construction of the overlying walls. A large wheel made five figurine was found in the largest of the rooms. The purchase of an adjacent field was finally completed in April of 2018. We decided to test the stratigraphy of the fields with a series of small trenches around the perimeter, beginning on the east side and in two areas near the middle of the, that had been disturbed in modern times. Most of the trenches on the periphery proved to be uninteresting. Several areas, however, yielded exciting results. We discovered the remains of two new monumental Tholos tombs. These were constructed as the final resting places for elite members of the Pelian society during the formative years of the Mycenaean civilization from roughly 1550 BC to 1400 BC. We call the smaller of the two tombs Tholos VII following Blagan's naming conventions. The excavation of Tholo VII had an inauspicious beginning. We decided to work there because of a pile of stones that was visible on the surface. This proved only to be a modern collection of field stones resting on a thin layer of earth. Underneath this pile, however, we found a mass of additional stones that did not appear to have any meaningful order. We removed those to a depth of one meter in an attempt to determine how deep the deposit went. When they continued beyond that, still without coherence, we changed strategies and put in two long test trenches in the shape of a cross. It was then that we found the curved walls that proved to be the outer walls of a tholos. By the end of the 2018 season, we had uncovered the Tholos wall along the west side, sections of the east side, and the top of the Stomian. The excavation of the entry passage proved to be more complicated than anticipated. It now appears that a wide dromos with a gentle slope was initially dug out to lead into the tomb. That passage was then filled in as was customary. When it came time to reopen the tomb for another burial, however, a new dromos was dug that was both narrower and deeper than the original. The two only joined together directly in front of the Stomian. The external face of the blocking wall was found intact to the level of the modern surface. The internal face, however, was not preserved, nor were were the lintel stones in place. It is not certain how high the dome would have originally stood. Tholos 7 is considerably smaller than Tholos 4, with a maximum diameter of just over 8 meters. Glimpses of the richness of the grave goods originally deposited within it are preserved in the artifacts that we have recovered. A gold signet ring depicting two calves amidst sheaves of grain was found along the west wall. A blue glass spacer bead consisting of four conjoined tubes and a, a blue glass star pendant, similar to one that has been found in an early tomb at Kakovatos to the north of Pelos, show that luxury objects were imported from beyond the Aegean. Both of the glass objects likely originated in the Near East. There are also fragments from a Canaanite amphora and numerous stone conuli in beads. Preliminary analysis suggests that the tomb was constructed toward the end of the late Hellatic 2A period. Another disturbance was noted in the center of the field during our initial examination. For that reason, a trench was established there, 
over what turned out to be the entryway of Tholos VI. A large fragment of a lintel stone was visible, as were a few blocks from the Stomian wall. These enormous blocks from the Stomian helped us to define the orientation of the dromos and hence the tholos. Because the lintel covering the entrance was at ground level when we began, it became clear early on that we would need to go down quite a ways to reach the bottom of the tomb. It was therefore deemed prudent to begin to cut a stairway as we went down. The surface of the tomb was conveniently bisected by a modern field road. A meter wide swath of this road was left in place and formed a central bulk. The post-depositional processes are much more elaborate in Tholos VI than in the others. The central bulk captures this textbook example of stratigraphy very well. The different phases of collapse, reuse, and abandonment are clearly visible. One can see the initial collapse of the stones from the dome at the bottom, the geometric through late classical strata, represented by the dark segment in the middle, and the post-classical to modern fill at the top. Photogrammetric models that document the progress of the excavation have been made on a regular basis. All the stones removed from the tombs have been kept in piles by trench and level. These piles now cover much of the original field. Should anyone ever wish to construct the collapse patterns, they could do so, and it won't be me. <laughs> From the beginning of the excavation in 2015, we dry sieved 100% of the soil removed from the trenches except for a standard two liter sample that was collected from all levels for flotation, which is being done by Tanya Valamoti and her team from the Aristotle University in Thessaloniki. Early on in the excavation of Tholo VI, however, small pieces of gold foil began to appear in large numbers. Some of these were so small that they could not be detected in regular dry sieving. We therefore began to water sieve all of the soil from both Tholos tombs, except for the flotation samples. This system has become more sophisticated over time as increasing volumes of soil need to be processed. Artifacts such as bead, nails, and small fragments of gold, as well as organics like animal and human bones and seeds are now extracted in the field. Tantalizing clues about the wealth that this Tholos contained were left behind. I will present only a few here, a gold foil cutout in the shape of a bee and a small gold granulated bead. We have also recovered fragments from over a dozen large palace style jars. The Dromos to Tholos VI, which was excavated during the 2019 field season, is over 15 and a half meters long and over four meters deep. At the end of the Dromos, we uncovered a unique feature that offers clues about ritual behavior associated with early Tholos tombs. This special deposit was identified in 2018 in an exploratory trench at the edge of the field when a few small pieces of gold adjacent to sterile soil were revealed. Further excavation has, has uncovered a deposit of very dark earth that is about seven meters long and bounded by sterile soil on three sides. We are excavating the area using a microgrid of 20 by 20 centimeter squares. The material from the feature dates to a single period at the beginning of Late Helladic II. There is extensive evidence for imports, not just from Crete, but also from the Near East. We have several examples of early glass spacer beads, likely imported from the Levant. More amazing, however, are two unique pendants or earrings that depict the Egyptian goddess Hathor. They are incised on one side with the image of the goddess above an elaborate lotus design. The other side has the same decoration and cloisonne with cells that are inlaid with semi-precious stones and glass. The closest parallels come from Byblos, 
and will be further discussed in a forthcoming article co-authored with Marwan Kilani. Finally, I want to turn briefly to the results of our most recent campaigns. Prior to the beginning of the 2021 field season, the northern portion of the field was used primarily as a repository for stones that were removed from the Tholos chambers and for the water sieving operation. In 2021, we discovered Middle Hellenic and early Mycenaean pottery and traces of walls in some small soundings in that area. In 2022, we concentrated all our efforts in this area and were richly rewarded. The earliest finds are from the Northwest Edge. Here, two early phases of the Middle Hellenic period are represented. After a hiatus in site use during the Middle Hellenic III period comes a mixed early Mycenaean deposit. This material is associated with a large hearth but no architectural remains. That deposit is followed by a succession of stratified surfaces with dense deposits of LH2A through LH3A material that can be linked with contemporary walls and associated drains. The biggest surprise here, however, has been the unanticipated discovery of a multi-room monumental building. This complex is the latest building in the area and has plastered floors and long, narrow rooms. A large plaster offering table rested on the uppermost floor. Next to it was a terracotta scoop. We now understand, thanks to conservation efforts by Yota Bori, Bori that the rim of the table of offerings is decorated. Outside the room was a deep pit filled with pottery and animal bones, including miniature vessels and animal figurines, quite probably the rain remains of a ritual feasting deposit that immediately preceded this complex. Our preliminary hypothesis is that this complex of rooms in the monumental building should be associated with mortuary activities, mortuary activities that took place on the ridge. The ceramic deposits are remarkably lacking in finds that would be associated with household use and instead are suggestive of ritual. The table of offerings confirms this. In conclusion, we have uncovered new evidence about the crypts used by the Pelian nobility in the early Mycenaean period and the associated funerary buildings. Use of the area for mortuary purposes began early in the Late Bronze Age, when the foundations for the later palatial society were being established. The Tholos tombs were used by elite members of society for multiple burials over decades or even centuries. The quality and quantity of finds confirm the importance of Pelos during this formative period. The number of fine imported objects attest to the elite's ability to acquire luxury goods and to participate in early late Bronze Age tra trade networks that extend beyond the Aegean. Jack will now continue by sharing with you some of our ideas of how, about how the Griffin Warrior fits into this large mortuary landscape. Thank you. There are several individuals in the audience who can attest to the uh, high quality of uh, pet cats and dogs <laughs> from the palace of Nestor. Uh, we've had uh, a number of them are immigrants or migrants to Athens already and to other parts of the world, in fact. So if you're interested, we're interested. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Sherry has uh, summarized the results of our excavations of the mortuary landscape of Pylos, much of it entirely unanticipated when we resumed research excavations in 2015. And in the remainder of our presentation, I intend to address a general question, who was the Griffin warrior? 
a question that has remained central to our research program over the past eight years already. We will consider prospects for addressing that question as we move toward a more intensive publication phase of our project. And lastly, we present and consider the significance of several outstanding objects found with the Griffin Warrior, objects that contribute to defining his social identity. Some of these are from among the very many that have not previously been made public by us. But before that, we want to offer you a peek at the ivory plaque that gave the Riff Griffin Warrior his name. And you may well wonder why we have hidden this object until now. The answer is that it was found in a terrible state. Shattered to smithereens over the shins of the warrior himself. Many of the fragments belonging to it are mere slivers of ivory and need to be fitted together like a complex three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Fortunately, we have had financial support for this from James and Mary Ottaway, uh, who honeymooned in Pylos quite a few years ago, and whose help so many years later has allowed us to engage the services of Julie Unruh, one of the foremost ivory conservators in the world. It was in fact Jim and Mary who gave the grave its name during Jim's visit as we were excavating in 2015. The results thus far are as follows. We know, now know that we have scenes of lions and griffins and they are fighting each other. The battle takes place amidst rockwork at the top and bottom of the plaque. We have obvious griffin wings, which you see here, traces of manes of lions and lion bodies. But we still have a long way to go before we can be certain of the exact size and nature of the scene, or even the character of the object that it adorns. What we can say is that the carving on the ivory was exquisite in its modeling and painstaking in its detail, as you see here on the lion's haunch. One major question relevant to addressing who was the Griffin Warrior also is, what is the relationship of the Griffin Warrior to others who lived in early Mycenaean Pylos? We have only made a beginning in addressing this question, although a rather promising one. Our collaborators in Harvard and Vienna, among them Yosef Lazaridis, David Reich, and Ron Pinhasi, with critical support from Malcolm Wiener and the Institute for Aegean Prehistory, have been successful in extracting ancient DNA from the Griffin Warrior and from samples from other contexts excavated 60, 70 years ago by Blagan's team. The results of our part of this study were reported in the August 25th, 2022 issue of Science Magazine. Our results document, not surprisingly, the close genetic relationships between individuals buried in local Mycenaean chamber tombs. It has in the past, generally been assumed that chamber tombs were family tombs, although little direct evidence for familial relationships has existed. DNA results now constitute concrete proof of this for Pilos, and more recently Kim Shelton has presented similar confirmation from her excavations at Ithonia near Nemea as has Lena Papazoglu from her excavations near Patras. One individual from Pylos is almost certainly also the product of a union between first cousins. Studies of skeletal remains from Blagan's Tholos Tomb 4, which Sherry showed you, by physical anthropologist Lynn Shepartz and her colleagues had previously identified genetically transmitted cranial, abnormal, cranial abnormalities that pointed in this same direction. 
Our next steps will be to compare the DNA of the Griffin warrior with that of individuals who lived at the same time as he did and who were buried in the new Tholos tombs that we have investigated near his grave. Was he related to them or not? Thus far, there is, however, no good reason to believe that the Griffin warrior came to Pylos from outside Messenia. The Griffin warrior is near the center of the Bronze Age cluster, in between Minoan and Mycenaean subclusters, and appears to be rather unremarkable for a late Bronze Age individual from the Aegean. Aside from the encouraging confirmation that the Griffin warrior was indeed a man, that would have been embarrassing, <laughs> can his remains tell us more about how special he was? In general, we know from analyses of skeletons from burials at Pylos conducted by Michael Richards that individuals buried in Tholos tombs ate better than those in chamber tombs and that men enjoyed better nutrition than women. We may assume that this was also the case for the Griffin warrior, although his own bones were so deteriorated that we have not been successful in retrieving dietary information from them. So, does archaeology itself suggest that there were others like the Griffin warrior? Perhaps. Blagan's team excavated a shaft grave beneath the much later northeast building on the Acropolis of the Palace of Nestor. The grave was entirely looted, but hints of the splendor of its grave goods remained. The Griffin warrior, and perhaps the individual in this shaft, appears to be, have been one of a special class of individuals of the early Mycenaean period who were singled out for special treatment, buried alone in shafts, either inside or outside Tholos tombs. Examples of such individuals, prestige burials, have long been known. Already from Christos Tsundas' excavations at the end of the 19th century, in the cyst beneath the floor of the Tholos tomb at Vafio, south of Sparta, and later from the Swedish excavations of the three shaft graves under the floor of the Vendra Tholos tomb at Midea in the Argolid, initially discovered by Dorothy Burr Thompson of the American School. All of these graves are characterized by a dearth of ceramics and an abundance of metal vessels. Sherry showed you one already. The grave of the Griffin warrior being no exception. Our grave also has several vessels manufactured from precious metals, one of which we present here in public for the very first time. It is a so-called Vafio cup, a shape named after the pair of justifiably renowned gold cups found by Tsundas in the cyst in the Vafio Tholos, and now displayed in the National Museum here in Athens to the wonderment of all. The Griffin Warriors solid gold cup weighs one quarter of a kilogram. Solid gold, although it had been crushed by the weight of the bronze basin over his midsection, and pressure from earth that filled the grave shaft after the collapse of a stone cover slab, which you see here. The base of the cup remained largely intact, but one side was pushed against the other, resulting in tears between these amazing repousse spirals in such high relief. The cup, not closely paralleled in the Aegean, uniquely, however, resembles a metal vessel depicted in a well-known Egyptian wall painting depicting foreign gift bearers on the Nile. That particular cup is carried in procession by a bearer in tomb 71, one of two Theban tombs of Senenmut, the steward of Amun. 
The Griffin Warriors Cup is strikingly similar to a spool-handled Vafio Cup depicted at the preserved left of the composition in Tomb 71. Senenmut was responsible for the construction of Hatshepsut's mortuary temple at Deir el Bare. I show you a uh, photograph I took here uh, featuring Margie Miles and a group from the American School of Classical Studies during a visit there. Uh, Senenmut also known for the construction of Hatshepsut's two great obelisks at Karnak. The representations of Aegean gifts in the painting of Senemut's tomb are the earliest of this sort from Egypt, although the figures are themselves not labeled as to their origins. Both the Vafio cyst and the grave of the Griffin warrior date to the mid-15th century BC, slightly later than the time of Hatshepsut. As we've already written in several scholarly papers, many objects buried with the Griffin warrior seem not only to have been displays of wealth, but also to have been selected to emphasize the multiple roles he played in early Mycenaean society. We have spoken of symbols of authority in his grave, such as this head of a staff, as well as those with religious content, such as this unique crystal lens with the image of a Minoan priest. Today, we want to concentrate on his role in combat a bit more. As is the case with so many warrior burials, offensive weapons buried with the Griffin warrior included spears. He had two of them as well as the sword and dagger that lay by his left side. The former is of particular interest since it looks forward to swords buried in slightly later warrior burials on Crete, although the Griffin warrior must have lived in times contemporary with the Minoan new palaces. It's long been understood that major innovations in weaponry were made by the Minoans in the course of the earlier phases of the Late Bronze Age. Nancy Sanders, who in the 1960s uh, codified the standard typology most often today used in Greek prehistory, wrote, the 15th century saw the invention of two new sword types in which the sword smiths attempted to combine the best points of earlier weapons. The result was the horned sword. The sword of the Griffin warrior is uncontestably one of the finest and longest horned swords ever found. And it is also a very early example of a horned sword of Sanders type C1, as Sherry already mentioned. In shape, it is virtually identical to several swords from Zafer Papura at Knossos and from Mycenae, chamber tombs, with the same arrangement of rivets and the midribs stopping at the same point. The bronze blade of the Griffin warrior's sword although broken in two places, is preserved in its entirety. Its hilt and pommel, made of ivory, bear a specially elaborate decoration in the so-called gold embroidery technique, as what Tsundas called chrysokendisi. According to this method, tiny gold gamma-shaped bars were set next to each other to form a continuous surface thousands of little gold bars. Once in place, the surface was polished and designs engraved on top of the surface. Here are some bars from our excavation. As tiny as likely to escape excavators who are not water sieving soil. Note that the scale here is two millimeters, not two centimeters. Our friends Eleni Costandinidi, Siridi, Nikos Papadimitriou, Anna Touche, and Akis Gumas 
have lately made important contributions to understanding this style of decoration. The technique is extremely delicate and time consuming, but can be fully reconstructed thanks to observations made on eroded pieces in the National Museum of Athens. The bars were set into a layer of glue that overlay a wooden, bone, or ivory pommel. The authors have suggested that this extraordinary time-intensive method was adopted in response to the curved shape of the pommels that inspired it. They wrote, a metal plate consisting of small bits joined together could better follow the curve of the object and offer a neater finish than a single leaf would be able to. Now, the design engraved on top of the gold gamma-shaped bar in the sword of the griffin warrior consists of lions that prey on long-horned feral goats, the renowned Cretan Agrimia. As we mentioned previously, conservation has been a particularly onerous task for us and we are grateful to have had consistent and reliable support for this work from sponsors such as Fokion Potamianos, the Kaplan Foundation, Malcolm Wiener, and the Piraeus Bank. Head conservator Kathy Hall of the Institute for Aegean Prehistory Study Center in Pachyamos, Crete, has been working on the gold sword from the grave of the Griffin Warrior for several years already. And at last, freelance illustrator Christina Kolb has been able to begin to record in detail the design incised on top of its gold embroidery. The bodies of the lions and agremia are also placed so as to avoid rivets and to fill the space available on the horns. This drawing was just made about a month ago. The lion snarls with his mouth open, grasps the goat's neck in a death grip, characteristic for a lion's kill, while the goat bleats with mouth wide open. One can only imagine how many other magnificent designs have been lost forever due to the disintegration of hilts like that of the Dendra sword. We have so much more to learn as we proceed with study and analysis of finds from excavations of the mortuary landscape of Pilos. There are times when it seems like this phase of our project will never end. With more than 20,000 objects in our inventory just so far, after one last season of large-scale excavation this summer, when we will explore in more detail the early Mycenaean buildings uncovered last summer, we plan to bear down even more intensely on conservation and publication. We have several papers now in, in press, including one that we hope will lay to rest definitively all doubts expressed by others over the time of the final destruction of the palace of Nestor. But as much as anything, we can already say that our excavations have demonstrated the significance of Pylos in the early Mycenaean period. Craft goods were being made at Pylos then, as demonstrated by offcuts from gold foil rosettes found in abundance and Pilos, to a greater extent than ever imagined before, was highly integrated, as Sherry has said, into the world of the Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean at the start of the Late Bronze Age, not only with Crete, but with the Near East. A project on our scale can only succeed with the support of many institutional and private sponsors and many collaborators. We have uh, particularly close relationships with a number of Greek institutions, which have been critical to our successes. 
and we look forward to continuing these relationships with the Aphoria of Messinia, the Democritus Institute, the National Hellenic Research Foundation, and as you see here, the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. In conclusion, uh, I will put the names of many of our uh, individual and corporate sponsors on the screen. But we would also like to invite you to read the reports that we published so far in Asperia. Uh, Bana has mentioned those. We are very grateful to Jennifer Satcher and to her staff for her superb editing and production. Our most recent paper didn't make the cover. <laughs> but it's one of the most important that we've ever published. <laughs> There is so much more to come, so please stay tuned. Thanks to you all for joining us here in Coatsin Hall, and good evening. Well, thank you so much to Shari and Jack for this really panoramic view of the mortuary landscape of Mycenae and Pylos and the complex construction of the Griffin warrior's identity. Uh, and I, I'd just like to take this opportunity to let those of you know, if you're not on our mailing list, we can solve this problem. Uh, uh, if you just send a, a, a quick email to receptionists at ASCSA. Uh, dot, um, uh, I think it's uh, edu.gr. Uh, we'll make sure that we, we add you to our listserv. It's now my pleasure to invite you to a reception uh, in honor of the work of the school and of our two speakers. And I thank you so very much for coming to our open meeting.